Welcome to chapter two, theories of development. In this chapter, we are going to go over the eight most popular theories of development. These theories attempt to explain how we develop and the major influences on development. When you think of a theory, think of it like a story. Sometimes stories are made up, sometimes they contain facts or truths, sometimes uh, later on you find truths to support the story. Same thing with theories. Sometimes theories are just a bunch of hypotheses strung together to tell a story or explain a complicated phenomenon. Sometimes theories are based on facts, and sometimes theories are created and then later facts are found that do align with those theories. So why do we look at theories instead of looking at just straight up scientific facts? Well, the reason why is because theories help us to organize a huge body of information. Think of it as like if you wrote down a list of different ideas and a list of different facts, theories allow us to take all of those ideas and facts and kind of put them together into one comprehensive story. And so this helps us to focus our search for new understandings of, in this case, development and human behavior. When we have a theory, we can use it as kind of a framework or a roadmap to help us figure out what we should research next to find the missing pieces to the puzzle or missing elements to our story. Theories help us to explain how findings can be interpreted. So when we do research and we get a fact or a finding, we, it's not always clear what that fact means or how we should interpret that fact. And so if we're able to take that fact and put it into the piece of a puzzle or put it into a story and give it a context, it helps us to make sense of what that fact means or why that fact is significant. And then finally, theories help us to identify major disagreements among scholars. So people might have different ideas on what causes development or what factors influence development, for example. And these ideas might differ, and this is okay. This is actually kind of relished in the scientific community because it allows us to see the holes or the weaknesses within our theories. And then we can do what we need to do to test the different ideas and get some evidence um, that's valid and reliable. So the ultimate goal of any theory is to provide a framework that furthers scientific vision and stimulates practical application. So in this chapter, we're going to look at eight of the major different developmental theories that attempt to explain the factors that influence and cause development in human beings. There are several different approaches to understanding human development, and within each of these approaches, there are several different theories. So the first approach is called the psychoanalytic approach and this approach was really created by Sigmund Freud. The underlying idea behind the psychoanalytic approach is that we have unconscious forces that motivate our development. And so the theory that we're going to be discussing from the psychoanalytic approach is the classic theory that comes from Sigmund Freud, and so it is called the psychoanalytic theory. It's the first theory we'll talk about, so you'll notice on the slides there's a number within a star, and so that will just help you to stay organized throughout the lecture to know when we switch to a different theory, uh, you'll see the star again with a different number. So at any rate, Sigmund Freud believed that the mind was divided into three parts, that we have a conscious mind, a pre-conscious mind, and an unconscious mind. And he liked to use this iceberg analogy to help illustrate these components of the mind or the structures of the mind. So the first part of the mind, as you can see on the slide there, is the part of the mind that's above the surface of the water. It's called the conscious. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's your level of awareness of both what's in your internal environment, meaning your mind, and your external environment, meaning the world outside of you and around you. And so Freud said that the conscious mind is easily accessible. Anyone can be aware of their thoughts and feelings and um, ideas that are existing within their conscious. And then just below the surface of the water, or the next structure of the mind, is known as the pre-conscious. And so this contains information that you're not currently thinking about or aware of, but if you wanted to bring it into a conscious state, you could do that pretty easily by just kind of reaching under the surface of the water into your pre-conscious and 
grabbing out that information. So maybe it's a dream that you recently had or a recent experience that you're not thinking about right now. But if you wanted to, you could easily bring those ideas or thoughts or memories into a conscious state and consider them. And then the last part of the mind, and the most important according to Freud, is the unconscious mind, which is uh, deep below the surface, and it's not available to us, it's not easily accessible, and we don't really know what's in it. So the things in the unconscious mind are things that are unpleasant, things that we don't necessarily like about ourselves or don't want to think about. Um, they're in the unconscious because we've sort of repressed them or pushed them down into there because they threaten our ego. They threaten the person that we want to be or the person that we want to show to the world. So you might find instincts or uh, animal urges that you're uncomfortable with, sexual urges, uh, traumas, memories that are painful, mistakes you've made, failures, um, anything that is kind of the dark side of your personality or existence would be pushed down into the unconscious. So Freud says that you can't really just know what's in the unconscious. Uh, to discover what's in the unconscious, you would have to do certain therapeutic techniques like dream interpretation, etc. So when we push stuff into the unconscious, it's sort of like we're trying to, or our mind is trying to forget those things. Sort of like sweeping something under a rug. However, Freud believed that you can sweep stuff under a rug, but that doesn't make those things not exist anymore. They continue to exist, and eventually they start to change the shape of the rug or change the person that you are. And this is how the unconscious affects our development. Overlaying these structures of the mind, the unconscious, conscious, and preconscious, are the parts of the personality, according to Freud. And he says we all have these three parts. They're known as the id, the ego, and the superego. And so we'll start with the id. The id is the part of our personality that's present at birth. It's the real us. It's the innate animalistic side of our personality. And it operates on what Freud called the pleasure principle, which is the idea that the it is only interested in maximizing satisfaction and minimizing tension. And what he means by tension is the tension that comes along with not getting what you want. And so the id is not concerned with consequences. It just wants what it wants when it wants it. It's demanding and it's needy. The id says to you, you're angry at that person, punch them in the face. It doesn't care about laws and repercussions of doing that. And then you have the superego, which is the exact opposite of the id. It's the part of the personality that is incredibly concerned with what other people think of you, um, it's concerned about morals. This is where the conscience is contained, the part of your mind that tells you what's right from wrong. The superego doesn't take risks. The superego would never go to Las Vegas. It's very buttoned up. It's very conservative. And it's very, very concerned about always looking perfect in the eyes of others. And then you have the ego, which is kind of this rational, cunning, aware part of the personality that focuses on kind of keeping the id and the superego at bay and only giving it in to them when it's appropriate. So it kind of says to the id, like, listen, you can't just always do whatever you want. Um, we'll give in to these urges of masturbation later on when we're alone, when it's um, appropriate. And it says to the super ego, you know, you're not perfect, you're going to make mistakes, that's okay, that's how we grow and develop as people. And so the ego operates on what's known as the reality of principle, uh, the reality principle, I'm sorry, which is the satisfaction of the demands of the id only when negative consequences will not result. And so all these components work together to create who we actually are as people, Freud said. So if you look at the slide, you can see the image of uh, the guy there. In the middle, I call him Sal. And then on the left, you see a devil. And on the right, you see an angel. And so if you're trying to figure out who the id, the ego, and the superego are in this picture, you could argue that the devil is the id, 
the super ego is the angel, and then Sal in the middle is the ego. The understanding of the previous terms in the psychoanalytic theory really just set us up to understand kind of the main point of Freud's theory or the heart of it, which is the psychosexual stages. And so this theory is pretty shocking to most students. Um, I guess you could say that it's pretty outlandish, but I encourage you to just kind of listen to it with an open mind and then form your own judgment on it afterwards. So um, just brace yourselves, okay? Um, just so I can kind of give you a framework or a model that we can kind of work within, let me explain the basics of the theory. The first is that there are different stages, Freud believed, that we go through in life. And each stage is represented by a part of our body that arouses us. He called it the focus of libido or the pleasure centers. And so at each stage, there is a crisis. And if we successfully resolve the crisis, then we move on to the next stage with no weird personality quirks. And if we don't successfully resolve the crisis, then Freud said we become fixated or stuck in that stage forever. And it affects us all throughout our lives. So the first stage is known as the oral stage. And Freud said that this stage lasts from zero to one years old. And he said that in the child's unconscious mind, um, what arouses the child or turns them on at this stage, the focus of libido, is their mouth, tongue, and lips. Before we go any further, it's important to note that I do teach human sexuality, and in thinking about childhood sexuality is generally very uncomfortable for people, and I understand that. Um, however, it's important to know that a child's conception of sex is not at all like an adult's conception of sex. Uh, we start getting sexual hormones released in our body in the 12th week of being inside of our mother's womb. And so our body is wired to have certain sexual responses. And as a child, you're really just kind of getting to know your body and figuring out what to do with those hormones and uh, what parts of your body feel good and things like that. But you don't have the idea of sex that adults do. So we do know that um, childhood sexuality is supported by science. We do know through research that children have a sense of sexuality. They will do things like play, I'll show you mine if you show me yours, and doctor. But these are all very innocent, um, not at all sexually explicit um, forms of kind of getting to understand their body and their mind a little bit better, um, generally. Okay, so back to the theory. So at the oral stage, from ages zero to one, the focus of libido is the mouth, tongue, and lips. And so the major crisis here, according to Freud, is to successfully wean the child off of breastfeeding. He says that if the child is breastfed for too long or not long enough, then they be, can become stuck in this stage forever or orally fixated. And so if they are orally fixated as adults, they might do things like smoke, overeat, bite their nails, chew on pencils. Um, he even went as far as to say that in terms of their personality, if a person is fixated in the oral stage, then they will swallow anything, meaning they're gullible or they will have a biting wit, meaning they're sarcastic. However, if you're breastfed for kind of just the right amount of time, then you move on to the next stage and you don't have any of these behaviors or personality quirks. The next stage is the anal stage. According to Freud, this is from the ages of one to three. And the focus of libido for the child is their anus. And so the crisis here is successful toilet training. And there's really two ways in which this can go. Um, so we'll start with the first way. And that is when the child is given too much attention for toilet training, meaning they're kind of uh, hounded or the parents are constantly pressuring them and asking them questions about do they have to go to the bathroom? Do they want to try? We got to potty train. Just making a lot of pressure on the situation. Freud believed that when this occurs, the child um, basically in its mind thinks, this is my anus, which I'm kind of obsessed with right now, and no one tells me what to do with it. 
I'll make the decisions of when to go to the bathroom and to use my anus. And so as a result, they will hold in their feces and refuse to go to the restroom. Freud believed that when this occurs, the child becomes anally fixated. And this lasts with them all the way through adulthood. And in adulthood, when we see this type of anal fixation, the person, um, is known as anal retentive. So you've probably heard that term before. Oh, you're so anal. Next time someone says that to you, if they do, uh, you can say to them, well, what type of anal am I? Because there's two types. Um, so we'll talk about the other one in a moment. But anal retentive um, people, according to Freud, generally are very concerned with orderliness, cleanliness, uptight, neurotic, punctual, things of this nature. And so the other direction that the anal stage can go into is that when the child is toilet training, they're not really given any attention for what they can do with their anus. No one really is paying attention to them. And so they might do things like leave feces in the toilet for others to see. Um, they might intentionally uh, defecate in their pants or defecate somewhere around the house for people to see their poo. Um, they might even go as far as uh, smearing their feces on the wall, Freud said, all in this pursuit of attention for what they can do with their anus, which is the part of their body that they're kind of obsessed with. And so Freud said if this happens, again, they're anally fixated, and this results in what's known as the anal expulsive personality. So an anal expulsive personality is messy, aggressive, hostile, um, kind of in your face, not really on time, not very clean generally. And so as uh, long as the child is toilet trained appropriately, meaning they're not given too much or not enough attention, then they uh, do not become fixated in this stage and they move on to the next stage. So the next stage is usually the most shocking stage for people. Uh, it's called the phallic stage. And so Freud believed that this stage lasts from three years old to six years old. And the child's pleasure, pleasure center is their genitals. And so uh, the way that this stage works is dependent on gender. So we'll start with uh, boys. Freud said that the major crisis here for boys is resolving the Oedipus complex. So Oedipus was a figure in Greek mythology that unknowingly married his mother and killed his father. So this is really what Freud adopted his theory from. So the Oedipus complex is the idea that unconsciously all little boys want to have sex with their mothers. Um, and so again, this is unconscious, something that people are not aware of. Um, but he said that in order to resolve the Oedipus complex, a series of events must occur. And so generally the way the resolution happens is the... A little boy somehow comes across a vagina. He sees his sister's vagina or his mother's vagina or through childhood sex play of doctor or I'll show you mine if you show me yours. He sees a vagina. And when he sees this vagina, his first thought is, what happened to your penis? And he has to then kind of theorize an explanation. And he thinks to himself, oh no, you must have also kind of been in love or wanted to have sex with your mother and your dad found out and cut off your penis. I don't want that to happen to me. And Freud said that this creates what's known as castration anxiety, kind of the fear that you're going to be caught um, lusting after your mother by your father and he is going to punish you by cutting your penis off. And so um, Freud said that what the child does at this point is they try to kind of throw the parent off or throw the father off by butting up to dad. And so by butting up to dad, maybe dad will be none the wiser about this attraction towards mom. And so the child is hanging out with dad all the time. And then um, eventually, kind of unplanned, the child starts to realize that dad's pretty cool and they actually have a lot in common. And at some point, this bonding occurs, which Freud called identification. And when identification occurs, then the boy decides, you know what, dad's pretty cool. Um, I'm not going to steal his woman. He can keep mom. I'll find my own woman later. And this is how the boy resolves the Oedipus complex. The next part of the theory has to do with females. And so Freud said that in the phallic stage, females have to deal with the crisis of the Electra complex. 
which according to Freud is the desire of little girls to sleep with their fathers or they lust unconsciously after their fathers. And so again, several things have to occur in order for the child to overcome the electric complex. And so generally what happens is the child through sex play or through observation discovers a penis and they think to themselves, gee, I really wish I had a penis. And this uh, creates what Freud called penis envy, which is the desire amongst the female to have the penis. And so in pursuit of getting a penis, uh, the little girl decides that she is going to kind of uh, get dad or, or make dad fall in love with her. And so she doesn't want to get caught by mom. So again, she hangs out with mom all the time to kind of throw mom off her track. And through hanging out with mom, she kind of accidentally starts to bond with her and realize she's pretty cool. And uh, actually in that moment, she also kind of feels bad for mom because she realized that they share this same penis envy, that they both have this desire for penises and they uh, unfortunately are females and, and don't have penises. And so the girl after identification and, and kind of coming to like mom uh, and feel empathy for her decides that she's going to let mom keep dad's penis and she'll find a penis of her own one day later on. And this is how the child overcomes the electric complex, according to Freud. So um, if the child resolves both of these complexes, uh, depending on if they're male or female, then they move on to the next stage, no problem. But if they don't, then it's, it's bad, according to Freud. Uh, they can develop deviant behavior um, for both males and females, this might be um, S&M, wanting to be spanked, um, kind of like your parents used to do, things like that. Uh, sexual dysfunction, promiscuity. He said that boys that don't resolve the Oedipus complex will become mama's boys and have this lifelong unconscious desire to sleep with their mom uh, reflected in being a, a mama's boy and how they act. And then um, unresolved electro complexes, he says you can see in females in adulthood when uh, females date men that are much older or father-like, kind of like the uh, Girls Next Door or uh, the Playboy Bunnies and Hugh Hefner or Anna Nicole Smith, you kind of think of that as a potential example of an unresolved electro complex. Okay, so then there's the latency stage, which is from the ages of 6 to 12. Here, the kid's kind of traumatized. It's been through a lot of weird stuff with the Oedipus, the electro complex, the anus, the oral fixations, all of that. And so it doesn't want to think about sex at all anymore. And so there is no focus of libido. In this stage, boys want to hang out with boys. Uh, girls have cooties, and girls want to hang out with other girls, no boys allowed, according to Freud. And in this stage is where, for the first time, kids might get picked on, or everything they do isn't as wonderful as their parents thought it was. Maybe people don't laugh at their jokes. Um, since they're spending more time with their peers, they're more available to that social ridicule that comes with interacting with others. Uh, outside of one's family. And so for the first time in their lives, their egos might start to get a little bruised for a night ball team, for example. And so it's at this stage that we develop what Freud called defense mechanisms. And we'll be talking about those defense mechanisms later on in the semester. But I just need you to know that this is when they are developed, according to Freud. And they're just basically ways that we lie to ourselves to protect our egos. They include things like denial, repression, regression, uh, but we'll discuss those later on. Okay, and then the last stage in the psychosexual stages is the genital stage. And it's important to remember Freud was around in Victorian times, so the lifespan was a little shorter. But he said this started at 12. I think if Freud was around today, he might say it started a little later. Uh, but in the genital stage, the focus of the libido goes back on the genitals. And the goal here is to reach full sexual maturity. And the way that you reach full sexual maturity is by having kind of quote unquote normal sex, nothing deviant or dysfunctional. Um, having consensual sex with someone that you have a loving relationship with. And so if all of the stages are completed successfully, then according to Freud, the person should kind of develop, quote unquote, normally. 
The next theory, theory two, is the psychosocial stages brought to us by Eric Erickson. And so when we're looking at this theory, I want you to think of questions like, how do you interact with other people? Are you outgoing or are you shy? Do you engage in TMI or do you tend to withhold information? Are you more conservative? And so the psychosocial stages of development is a theory that attempts to help us understand how people develop in terms of their interactions with others. Um, it helps us to understand how people come to feel about others. Do you think people tend to be trustworthy or are you pretty skeptical of people? Do you think that most people are good or bad? This theory attempts to explain how you came to that perspective. And then the last thing the theory does is it helps us to understand how people view themselves, how they gain knowledge on the self, um, kind of their self-esteem or the way they, they view themselves in terms of am I good or bad, am I important or un unimportant, things of that nature. And so at each stage, much like Freud, there's a crisis. Um, if the crisis is successfully dealt with and resolved, then the person moves on to the next stage um, and kind of progressing appropriately in their development. But if they don't resolve the crisis successfully, then it's going to affect them in their adulthood. It's going to stick with them through their whole lives, and it's kind of going to stunt their development. So the first stage in Erickson's psychosocial stages, and there are eight stages, is known as infancy. And Erickson said that infancy lasts from zero to one years old. And so the uh, child's basic task, or Erickson often referred to it as a core struggle, Freud referred to it as a crisis, is to um, develop a sense of trust versus mistrust. And so the way that the infant develops trust is if they are cuddled and loved and nurtured and cared for. When they cry, someone comes to their assistance, uh, feeds them, changes their diaper, things like this. If this occurs, then the person develops trust and goes through life being pretty trustworthy of others. So the resolution of all of this, kind of what sticks with them throughout their life then, is this feeling of hope, hope that other people will come through, hope that other people will deliver and be accountable and reliable. If the child is sort of neglected or not attended to, then they develop mistrust, which often sticks with them all through life. So if you've ever known someone that says, oh, I just have a really hard time trusting people, Erickson might argue that this is due to uh, what occurred in stage one, in infancy. Maybe they weren't given enough attention or loved, or maybe they were neglected. Stage two occurs in early childhood and is from the ages of one to three years old. The crisis here is developing autonomy, which is basically a self-governing state or a sense of independence, versus shame and doubt, doubting your abilities and feeling shame about the person that you are. And so in order for the child to develop a sense of autonomy, they need to master control over themselves and kind of accomplish things. Uh, Erickson said really they kind of gain a sense of self-control and accomplishment by doing activities such as toilet training successfully and also engaging in play and kind of learning to deal with their emotions. So maybe as they're playing with something or venturing off into doing a new task they've never done before. They get stumped or frustrated or confused. And if they learn to control those emotions and not kind of have a meltdown, then they develop this sense of autonomy. But if they don't successfully complete these basic tasks like toilet training or learning to regulate and control their emotions, then they live their life with a sense of shame and doubt, doubting in their abilities and a sense of shame of who they are. So successful resolution of this stage results in will, uh, the will to pursue challenges and overcome obstacles, the will to try new things, to be ambitious. And so this is what would be reflected in adulthood. Stage three is preschool preschool children ages three to six, and the crisis here is developing initiative or a sense of competence 
versus guilt. Um, and so initiative is really established through play and successful play, feeling like they take action, they come up with games or ideas on their own, and then they go through those activities and everything works out and it's just fine. And this makes them feel like it's okay to take an active stance, like it's okay to go for things and take initiative. Um, however, if through play, there are unexpected outcomes, like they make a mistake, or they make a mess, or someone gets hurt, or something goes wrong, or they are ridiculed or rejected. Um, maybe they propose a new game to play with their friends and all their friends tell them that's stupid. Um, if these things happen a lot, then they start to develop a sense of guilt, um, feeling guilty kind of illogically for making mistakes or feeling guilty that they're not a good enough person to have successfully completed that task. Um, and so this feeling of guilt then would stick with them throughout their entire life uh, if they did not successfully resolve that crisis. However, if they did successfully resolve that crisis, then they would take initiative more often as adults, take an active stand, not be afraid to express their opinions or try new things, um, taking leadership roles. And so a resolution to this stage is feeling a sense of purpose, that what they do has meaning, um, that what they do is directed in a way that has some sort of uh, purpose or fulfillment associated with it. Erickson believed that the first six years of our lives really have the biggest influence on our development and ultimately the biggest influence on shaping the person that we become as adults. However, he did say that it's possible to kind of reverse what we learned in these first six years through self-observation and self-awareness and really working on ourselves later on in life. So stage four is middle childhood, and this is from six to 12 years old. And the crisis here is industry versus inferiority. So industry refers to setting goals. Here we're mostly talking about setting goals at school, learning how to read, write, calculate, and do physical skills in PE class as well as setting goals pertaining to uh, social interactions. So making friends, um, getting to know new people that you've never met before, things like that. So if we're able to successfully develop this sense of industry, complete our goals, um, then we kind of have resolved the, the conflict successfully and we develop a sense of competence that really lasts with us throughout our whole lives. However, if we don't develop a sense of industry, then we develop a sense of inferiority, uh, which might come from not successfully um, accomplishing or completing our goals. And so a sense of inferiority means that we feel less than others. And again, this might stick with us well into adulthood. Stage five is called adolescence, and this occurs from the ages of 12 to 18 years old. Here the crisis is developing a sense of identity versus role confusion. So developing identity means knowing who you are, knowing um, what your morals are, what you believe is right versus wrong, um, having political views perhaps, or knowing your religious views and really owning them and not just having kind of adopted them from other people, but actually identifying in them and believing in them yourself. Having identity also means kind of being able to see the person that you are and who you're going to become, and also having a sense of how you're going to get where it is that you want to go. Um, what kind of career might you want to have? Do you want to get married one day? Do you want to have kids? And what do you envision being the path that you're going to take in life to achieve those goals or kind of have that identity in the future? And so... If you um, develop a sense of identity, then you, uh, in adulthood, for the resolution is you have a sense of fidelity. However, if you don't develop a sense of identity, then you have what Erickson called role confusion, which is kind of not really being sure what your morals are or having a sense of stable values. Maybe this makes you more open and susceptible to being manipulated by others or taken advantage of. Um, and not really having a strong sense of who you want to be in the future. Erickson also suggested that during this time of adolescence, um, teens engage in what he called a psychological moratorium. This is observed in other countries, but it's not something that we do in America. 
However, a psychological moratorium really refers to a period of time generally after high school and before college where you think about what it is that you want to do. Here we kind of just go right from high school into college generally and we pick a major and then we decide that that is what we're going to work towards in college and become that. But Erickson thought that this might not be the best idea because what if you decide at the age of 18 that you want to be a nurse but by the time you're 25 you realize that that's not what you want to do. Um, so what he suggests is that after high school you take a year you travel, you try out different occupations, you try out different um, hobbies and activities, and you really discover yourself and find out who you are and what you like to do, and then perhaps you go back to college and pursue that. Stage six, young adulthood, is from 18 to 25 years. And Erickson says that the only way we can really enter adulthood is if we developed a firm sense of identity in adolescence. But if we don't, really discover who we are in that stage, then we can never really fully enter into adulthood in a way that's normal or healthy. And so the crisis of young adulthood is developing intimacy versus isolation. So intimacy refers to being able to bond and connect with other people and really establish an authentic, genuine, sincere relatability with another person. And so intimacy means kind of shedding your ego, putting down your walls, showing another person who you really are. And then if we don't develop intimacy, we often develop isolation, which means that we alienate ourselves from other people. We don't establish uh, close connected relationships and we feel kind of a sense of depravity from all of this. However, if we do develop that sense of intimacy, then we often experience love. Um, and that experience of love usually comes in adulthood. Love in the form of romantic or even sexual relationships. Stage seven is middle adulthood from the ages of 25 to 65. And the crisis here is generativity versus stagnation. So gener generativity refers to this need to create or produce or leave a legacy behind. And so there's different ways to go about this. Maybe you generate lessons for your kids or you leave them with wisdom um, or you create a book, um, an autobiography about yourself or you create a garden. You're leaving something behind. Maybe this is uh, creating a business or climbing the corporate ladder, some um, mark on the world. And so if you are able to develop generativity, then the resolution to this is a sense of caring, caring about uh, your own self-worth, about your um, people in your family, about what you have done in this life. And if you don't generate, then you develop a sense of stagnation, which is that you're kind of stuck and you're not moving forward or progressing as an individual. You're not developing any further. Stage eight, maturity or late adulthood, is from 65 years until death. The crisis here is integrity versus despair. So integrity refers to the idea that when you are this age and you look back over your life, you don't have any regrets, you don't wish that you could do it over again, and you have this understanding that death is natural, and you're kind of okay with it. Not that you are, you know, calling out for it or wanting it to come, but you've accepted that it's just a part of the life cycle. And so if you develop this sense of integrity, then uh, you die kind of at peace and you have a sense of wisdom in your later years. However, if you don't uh, develop integrity, then Erickson says you kind of go into this state of despair and you die wishing you had another chance at life feeling unhappy and unfulfilled. So it's important to look back over your life with no regrets and understand that the mistakes you made were really just part of the process and that we all fail and mess up and we just have to learn and grow and develop from those mistakes rather than allowing your failures to become a burden and put you into a state of despair. Okay, please pause the lecture here and go to Moodle and complete lecture activity one. Once you've completed that activity, please come back to this point in the lecture and resume. 
The next theory comes from Jean Piaget, and it is a cognitive developmental approach. So what Piaget was interested in is why do some children throw toys on the floor and not look for them, while other toys while other children throw toys on the floor and then do look for them, and questions related to this. And so he wanted to find these answers by looking at cognitive development. So cognitive development is the process by which a child's understanding of the world changes as a function of their age and of their experiences. So this theory seeks to explain intellectual advancements across development. Uh, we call intellectual advancements cognitive structures. And so cognitive structures are really the basic tools of cognitive development. So what is a child able to understand at different points in their development? Are there different ages where a child can understand one thing, where a child won't look for the toy, and then later on they can understand something different and, and will look for the toy? And so these accomplishments or these intellectual advancements, being able to understand the world better um, with age or with experience are known as these cognitive structures. And so Piaget's theory of cognitive development is the leading theory uh, in the realm of cognition and understanding what children understand and what they don't at what age. There are four stages in Piaget's cognitive development theory, and we'll be looking at the details of these stages uh, throughout the semester. But here's just a brief overview. So it's important to know that the stages differ in the quantity of information acquired at each age and the quality of the information. In other words, what they can understand gets harder and gets um, more, to be more in quantity as they develop. And so, um, they can move from one stage to the next stage as they mature. However, they can't skip stages. Um, they must complete one stage before they can go to the next stage, cognitively, that is. So the first stage is known as the sensory motor stage, and this is from birth to two years old. This is where the child really begins to interact with the environment. When you're born, um, you don't really have the ability to represent the world in which you live. For example, if you were to say to me, let's get a burrito, I could make a mental image or picture a burrito in my mind. If I said to you, I don't know what a burrito is, you could draw it for me or you could explain it to me using language. However, if neither you nor I have any experience of a burrito, it would be difficult to make that mental image or explain it or draw it symbolically for somebody. And so this is really where infants are. They don't have experience um, to be able to represent the things in the environment. So they have to kind of gain a base understanding of the um, things that exist in their environment through touching, chewing, shaking, um, and playing with different objects. The next stage is the pre-operational stage. This is from two to seven years old. And this stage is really characterized by language and the child's ability to start representing the world symbolically. And so they are able to describe people, events, and feelings because now they can picture things in their mind. They can make those mental images um, and describe them and even draw them as they get older. And then there's the concrete operational stage, which is from the ages of 7 to 12. And this stage is characterized by logical thought. Um, the child learns rules such as conservation. We'll talk later about what conservation is. But they're able to start understanding math um, and more difficult abstract ideas. And then finally, the last stage is formal operational stage. And so this is from the ages of 12 to adulthood. And this is where the adolescent can transcend these concrete situations and think about the future. They can think about hypotheticals. They can use techniques to problem solve. And so it's important to note that they can't do this until they're at the formal operational stage. Um, we can't represent our environment using language until we're in the pre-operational stage, for example. So it's true for all people that in certain age groups, we can only understand certain things. And we can't understand these things until we're in this age group. So students often ask me, does this indicate that we're on some type of program that we're just running some program since we all can't understand 
um, this until we're two, and then we don't understand the next concept until we're this age. So it's pretty interesting theory, and it attempts to kind of address those issues of why is it that we can only understand things at certain ages. In an attempt to answer those questions about why is it that we can only understand certain things at certain ages, Piaget points to what he calls functional invariants, which are the psychological me uh, mechanisms of adaption and organization. So basically what he's saying here is that we have developed these cognitive structures, these intellectual advancements, to help us better respond to our environment so that we can adapt to it and be able to survive and even reproduce in a very Darwinian type of way. And so our ability to understand certain things at certain ages is based on what's best for our survival, what's best for our likelihood to adapt to our environment. And so these functional invariants or this process of adaption includes two major components, assimilation and accommodation. So assimilation is when we take in information and we apply it to what we already know, or we incorporate data into our existing cognitive structures. For example, when a child first sees a Dalmatian dog, the child will interpret this information based on his or her existing mental frameworks and will label it doggy. Accommodation is the manner by which cognitive structures change. So sometimes we take in information that's different than what we already know, and that new information changes the way we view the world or changes our mental framework or cognitive structure. So we change what we take in and we're also changed by it. So an example of accommodation is that uh, if you look on the slide, when the child saw a cow for the first time, she will assimilate it to her schema of doggy as a four-legged animal. But then her mother will tell her, hey, that's a cow, and she will accommodate this new information, and then will start referring to that animal as a cow, not a doggy. The child will learn that not all four-legged animals are called doggy, and that is the process of accommodation. The next theory, theory four, is the cultural framework approach, which is brought to us by Lev Vygotsky. And he says that cognitive growth, or what we can understand, depends on our interactions with the people around us. But he goes on to make the point that the interactions that we have with people around us also depend on our culture. So for example, our kinesphere. In America, we know our kinesphere, or how um, comfortable we feel standing apart from someone is three feet. But like we talked about in chapter one, in other cultures where they're more crowded, like Asian cultures, uh, certain Asian cultures, their kinesphere is only one feet. Uh, if you look someone in the eye or not when you talk to them, there's a lot of cultural influences on how we interact with other people. And Vygotsky thought that this also affects how we develop cognitively or what we can understand in the world. So he said that there are dual paths of cognitive development, and these two paths happen simultaneously. And so the first path are known as elementary processes, and elementary processes are biological. This is referring to the way the brain develops, and we know that as we grow, new neural connections are made in the brain and uh, the structures within the brain change and become more developed. Um, and then the second path of cognitive development are psychological processes. And these have to do with how we cognitively process social cultural influences. So the way we interpret what we observe in our society and culture, the way we make sense of what we see in our society and culture. And so there's really three fundamental themes of Vygotsky's theory. Um, the first is the concept of development, which refers to those biological processes being transformed into higher psychological processing. For example, um, our brain development. So we have this part of the brain known as the Brokaw's area. And as the Brokaw's area becomes more developed, our language skills get better. Um, the second fundamental theme of his theory is social and cultural development. And this refers to observations that we make in our society and culture, like we talked about. So observations get interpreted and then they later become expressions. They become our speech, what we say. And so the third theme is in fact speech, both internal speech, 
of what we say to ourselves and external speech, what we say to other people. So the content or the expressions of what we say to ourselves and what we say um, and what others say to us Vygotsky believed is one of the most powerful tools in human development, maybe more influential on the way we develop um, than anything else in his theory. Um, now we're going to watch a quick video on Vygotsky's theory. Vygotsky argued that learning impacts development. With early math, for instance, learning skills can hasten development. Rather than viewing this early counting as just rote reciting, Vygotsky would argue that it nudges a child towards a concept of the symbolic nature of number. Children construct knowledge. Learning can lead development. Development cannot be separated from its social context. Language plays a central role in mental development. Vygotsky envisioned a more complex relationship between development and learning than either the young Piaget or the elderly Pavlov had conceived. As we will see, Vygotsky gave great value to assisting children to use strategies to further their intellectual capacities. The next time we count them, I'm going to help you. Okay. Put your finger out and we'll count each one. One, two. It is in this context that we will discuss the best known part of Vygotsky's work, the zone of proximal development. Point to each one close to the bear and count loudly. One, two, three. But when the teacher structures the activity differently, the same child can perform at a higher level counting meaningfully to 17 without missing any bears. 15, 16, 17. Great job, Quentin. The area between the level of independent performance and the level of assisted performance is the zone of proximal development. It is here where the teacher must focus attention. Lev Vygotsky was born about 100 years ago in 1896 in Tsarist Russia. As Jews, the Vygotsky family, however prosperous, were outsiders in Russia under Tsar Nicholas, limits on how many could be formally educated. The odds were great, but miraculously Vygotsky gained a place. He also became interested in psychology and began doing research in this field. He also managed to write seven books and dozens of articles before dying at age 37 in 1934. For Vygotsky, the social context influences more than just attitudes and beliefs. It has a profound influence on how we think as well as what we think. Vygotsky and his colleagues witnessed the rapid social changes in the Soviet Union that occurred when non-technical cultures did to participate in the quite technically advanced Western culture of the new empire. Vygotsky's work reminds us of the processes necessary for children to regulate their own internal and external behavior. Encouraging children to draw what they are experiencing, to talk to each other about it, to write about it, and even to talk to themselves about it, enables them to move towards being independent learners. Good job, Alex. The next theory of development comes from the behavioral approach. And the behavioral approach to human behavior and mental processes and development is just the idea that we are products of our environment, that we are just kind of these balls of clay that are shaped by the environment in which we live, and that if we lived in a different environment, we probably would be entirely different people acting in different ways. And so the leading um, theory in the behavioral approach is operant conditioning. And operant conditioning was really introduced to the world by B.F. Skinner. And so B.F. Skinner very famously made what's known as a Skinner box. 
And he would put a rat inside the Skinner box and get the rat to do certain behaviors based on the environment. So for example, if a light is on, then the rat will press a lever in the box, um, as you're going to see here in this clip. So here is a rat inside of a Skinner box, and every time the light is on, he'll press that lever, but when the light is off, he actually won't press that lever. And so Skinner trained the rat to do this by using reward. Every time the light is on and the rat presses the lever, food comes out of that little hole there. But if the light's off and the rat presses the lever, no food. Which makes the rat learn to press the lever when the light's on and not press the lever when the light's off. So it was discoveries like the rat pressing the uh, lever that led him to think deeper about this concept of rewards and punishments in the environment. And he started to theorize that if we are rewarded for behavior, we'll continue to do that behavior. But if we're punished for behavior, then we'll no longer do that behavior. And so he devised another very famous sort of um, example of this. Um, called the pigeon banana problem in which he started by training a pigeon. Every time the pigeon would touch this stuffed banana, he'd get a reward of food. And every time the pigeon would touch this orange box, he would get a reward of food. And then the next stage in the test was to suspend the banana from the ceiling of a box and then put the little orange box on the floor kind of away from the banana and see if the pigeon could figure out how to get the banana. So here is um, a video of the banana pigeon problem, and you can see the pigeon is going over to the banana. He's trying to get it because this is what he's been given a reward for in the past, touching the banana. But today it's just out of his reach for some reason. So he moves on to the, oh wait, he's going to try again for the banana. One more time, maybe I can get it. Nope, what the heck's going on here? This is weird. Okay, I'm going to try again. Usually I get food for this. No food. Can't get it. Okay. I'm going to move on to this orange box. Usually if I touch this box, I get food. Nope. Let me try this banana again. All right. I'm going to come back to this. I'll peck it. See if I can get a reward for this. Nope. All right. Wait a second. This box is moving. So the pigeon begins to figure out that uh, the box moves. And then he can stand on it. It's getting closer to that banana. And he pushes it a little further. And he flips it on its side. And then boom, the pigeon gets the banana. So the idea is the reason the pigeon was able to solve that problem is because he got rewards for those behaviors in the past. And so this leads us into the theory of operant conditioning. So again, B.F. Skinner is the father of operant conditioning and operant just means voluntary behavior. So the idea again is uh, very simple, that if you are rewarded for behavior, you'll do it again. If you're punished for behavior, you won't do it again. And so we all use operant conditioning on each other all the time. When we say things like, great job, thank you, I agree, fantastic, I love you. These are all examples of rewards, verbal rewards. And what we're telling the person is, hey, I like how you just treated me. Here's a reward, a thank you, a verbal compliment. And this reward inspires the person to want to continue treating you in that way. So it's a very simple concept, uh, but here is a video from the Big Bang Theory illustrating operant conditioning. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. What was that? You said be nice to Penny. I believe offering chocolate to someone falls within the definition of nice. It does, but in my experience, you don't. Oh, sorry, Sheldon. I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. Thank you. You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? I'm oh, sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Hold on, 
let me take this in the hall. <laughs> You'll never guess how they got to a place you would want. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Chocolate? No, I don't want to. <laughs> Sheldon, you can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. <laughs> Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. No. This has to stop now. I'm not suggesting we really make her jump out of a pool. I thought the bazinga was implied. I'm just tweaking her personality. You're sanding off the rough edges, if you will. No, you're not sanding Penny. Are you saying that I am forbidden from applying a harmless, scientifically valid protocol that will make our lives better? Yes, you're forbidden. Bad, Leonard. <laughs> Okay, let's learn some of the terminology in operant conditioning. So the first term you need to know is reinforcer. And so a reinforcer is anything that increases a response, increases a behavior, um, or a mental process. So there's two types of reinforcers. There are positive reinforcers and there are negative reinforcers. But positive and negative do not mean what we kind of instinctively want to assume that they mean. In this context, positive means to add, like in math, and negative means to remove, like in math. Positive does not mean yay, and negative does not mean boo. Uh, they're referring to mathematical terms. So a reinforcer is always a good thing. I suggest in your notes you put a big old smiley face next to the word reinforcer um, because we always want a reinfor reinforcer. On the exam, there's a question that tries to trick you by implying that you know you wouldn't want a negative reinforcer because you wouldn't want anything negative in your life. But you do. A negative reinforcer is great. Reinforcers are always rewards. They're always good. We always want them and they always increase response. So a positive reinforcer means to add something to someone's environment to increase a response. And since reinforcers are good things that make us smile, we're adding something pleasant to their environment to increase a response. For example, uh, you go to work for two weeks and your employer adds a paycheck to your environment. This is pleasant. And this increases the response of you coming back to work next week. Negative reinforcer means to remove something from someone's environment to increase a response. So here we're going to be removing something unpleasant, something the person doesn't like as a reward. So for example, my Jetta, I drive a Jetta, and uh, when I go over 20 miles per hour, it makes a very annoying, unpleasant beeping sound. And so what it's trying to get me to do is put on my seatbelt. So this only happens if I don't have my seatbelt on. So once it makes this very annoying beeping sound, I automatically put on my seatbelt and that annoying beeping sound is removed. And so my Jetta is operantly conditioning me, negatively reinforcing me, to uh, increase the response of putting on my seatbelt by removing the unpleasant, annoying, beeping noise when I do so. Another example of a negative reinforcer is, let's say that you have chores every Friday, and the chore you hate the most is cleaning the toilets. But your parents make a deal with you that if you get a good 
progress report this week from your teacher, then they will remove the unpleasant task of you having to clean the toilet. They'll take it off your chore list. So this is a negative reinforcer. This is a good thing. We're being rewarded by having something unpleasant removed from our life to increase the response of doing well in school. Okay, uh, the next term you need to know is punishment. So you can put a frowny face next to the word punishment in your notes. Um, I know it's cheesy, but trust me, it'll help you later. Okay, so punishment is never a good thing. No matter what word I put before the word punishment, you don't want punishment. And punishment always decreases response. It always stops a person from doing a behavior. So remember that positive and negative uh, in this context, refer to math ma uh, mathematical terms. So positive means to add, and negative means to remove or to subtract. Um, and so positive punishment is adding something to someone's life to decrease a response. And here, since punishment is a frowny face exper uh, experience, we're adding something unpleasant. For example, this is Sally. Uh, on the slide here. She's been back talking to her mama. So her mom added something unpleasant to her environment in the form of a spank to decrease the response of back talking. Okay, and then we have negative punishment. And so negative punishment is removing something from someone's life to decrease a response. So since punishment is not a fun thing, we're going to be removing something pleasant to get someone to stop doing something. So if you've ever been grounded or had your phone taken away, you have been the victim of negative punishment. Uh, so let's say that um, you keep sneaking out at night and so your parents decide that the way they are going to punish you is by taking away your cell phone. And so the hope is that if they remove the something pleasant, your cell phone, this will decrease the response of you sneaking out at night. Okay, what I'd like you to do is pause the lecture now and go to Moodle and complete lecture activity two. When you are done with that, come on back to the lecture. Theory six is the social cognitive learning theory, and it comes to us from Albert Bandura. So um, basically this theory believes that your thoughts influence your development greatly. Um, and the way that you come to think uh, habitually is really based on what you experience in your world. Um, and so this could involve things like observations, thoughts, memories, experience, and then how you go about processing information. And so there are three factors to the social cognitive learning approach. There are the cognitive factors. And so the cognitive factors really refer to how we process information. And it includes things like our self-talk, um, outcome expectations. If I do this, do I expect to get a reward? And cognitive factors are also based on prior experiences, um, which create memories and thoughts um, and affect the way we process information. And then another factor is the environmental factor. And so the envir environmental factor in the social cognitive learning theory refers to how um, our environment influences us, particularly our parents, our peers, our culture. And so Bandura says that one of the main processes that goes on here that affects environmental factors is observational learning. And observational learning is learning by observing someone else. And probably the most profound a model that we have or person that we observe in our lives is our parents or our primary guardians as we're developing in our formative years. Um, and so there is some support for this idea of observational learning uh, through research done on mirror neurons. So we'll look at mirror neurons in detail later on in the semester. But basically what they are is that we have neurons or brain cells in our brain that fire when we watch someone else do something. But what's interesting is that they fire in our brain in the exact same area as the person that's doing the thing. Um, so basically they're mirroring the neurons in the other person. And it's thought that 
these mirror neurons might indicate that the ability to model behavior is innate in some way. And so Darwin might argue that therefore the ability to model behavior is necessary to our survival. Uh, that we watch the way our parents eat food, for example, and then we um, imitate how they eat food or how they interact with people and we imitate that and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the last factor is behavioral factors. And so this is what we do and uh, what we believe we can do. And so um, our self-efficacy is a major component of behavioral factors. Self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to successfully complete a specific task. Um, and then also what skills you have developed over time. Um, your kind of belief in yourself and the skills that you possess, uh, Bednar believed, affect your development. So now we're going to watch a brief video clip that um, explains Bandura's social cognitive learning theory. In this program, we're discussing the social cognitive theory of human behavior. Now, a comprehensive theory must explain how people acquire competencies, values, and styles of behavior, but it must also explain how people motivate and regulate their behavior. We'll examine some of the basic premises and applications of social cognitive theory in this program. For years, psychological theories of human behavior tended to favor one-directional causation. Psychodynamic theory, such as the one developed by Freud, placed the causes of behavior in the individual. And these theories proposed that behavior was driven by unconscious impulses and complexes within the individual. Behaviorists placed the causes of behavior in the environment. In this one-sided view, behavior is shaped and controlled by environmental forces. In social cognitive theory, self-development, adaptation, and change occur through an interplay of personal, behavioral, and environmental influences. In this model, people are producers of their environment, not just products of it. People's knowledge, their beliefs, values, and biological endowment influence how they behave. Behavior elicits social reactions. I think if we add some graphics, which here, in turn that it would really can alter the course of behavior. Do you want to try just holding the tail section first? The environment, which includes social interactions such as instruction, modeling, and persuasion can alter personal characteristics. And one's behavior can also change one's personal characteristics as when we use performance feedback to improve our skills. An individual's personal characteristics such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, and social status can also evoke differing reactions in others when the behavior is the same. The seventh theory is a bioecological model, and it was created by a gentleman named Bronfen Brenner. Uh, he says that development depends on four major areas, the first of which is known as proximal, proximal processes. And so these are reciprocal interactions between a person and the environment. The idea is that the way uh, your environment makes you feel or uh, treats you affects the way you react to your environment and the way you react to your environment affects your environment. So think of it like if you go to a party and there's a bad vibe. Um, this might put you in a bad mood and then you might be less friendly with people and this then affects the vibe of the party even more. The next component is the person. And so the person also affects their development 
in that their temperament or their disposition um, is an important thing to consider in looking at how someone develops over time. And then the third component is the context, the environmental features of um, in which the person develops. So what is going on in the environment? Um, what are their parents like? What's their socioeconomic status? Do they have food? How do these things affect someone's development? And the fourth component is time, the way that a person changes over time. And so in regards to the environment, um, Bronfen Brenner argues that the environment is really a nested set of structure, that there are many different layers to an environment. And so um, we're going to watch a video now that looks at the different layers within the environment. And those four layers are the microsystem, the mesosystem, the exosystem, and the macrosystem. It started with the bang a while ago, 15 billion years of particle snow leads to little old me in my family tree. I'm related to a star, I'm related to pre. Cambrian stromatolites under the ocean, natural selection caused a commotion. And here I am, right in the middle, just a piece of a long biological riddle. But I'll try to look at things from another perspective. Brown for Brenner said I should be reflective, so here I go. Let me know if I should sing slow I'm the youngest of three and that affects me Always tagging along cause I wanted to see What the older kids did cause it was cool I'd repeat what they said the next day at school They all went to college so I did too Thought I knew what I'd do but I hadn't a clue Till a few years through in general ed A couple neurons fired inside my head And I said if it weren't for the circumstances Surrounding my birth I wouldn't be me I have food on my plate, batteries and my toys, and I love my family. From a nice little town with nice little steeples, the land of upper middle class Republican people. And there I was, right in the middle, just a piece of a socioeconomic riddle. say when it comes to the person I am today I don't know I don't know can a domino take a step out of the row I don't think so unless an outer force happens to collide and cause a change of course but in the end I still feel a little bit bleary of Bronf and Brenner's ecological theory The eighth and final theory is the developmental systems theory, created by a gentleman named Lerner. And uh, this theory is based on a set of beliefs leading to the conclusion that we construct our own views of the world. The theory begins with the idea that psychological and biological characteristics function by reciprocal interactions within our environment. And so the way in which we perceive the world is really the product of our brains um, in terms of their biological capabilities and also in terms of the way we think. And so um, we know that perception is imperfect, that perception is flawed. However, this theory is really arguing that perception is our reality and that reality is what shapes our development. So. When I say that perception is flawed or that perception is imperfect, we know that people tend to have selective attention, that they often miss the whole picture, that we interpret information differently than each other. For example, if you look at the slide, you'll notice a picture in the middle. And when you look at that picture, it might appear that it is an old woman or it might appear to you as a young woman. So this is really just a matter of perception. We all see the world differently based on our experiences, knowledge, expectations, and really what we want to see. And so to kind of illustrate this idea that perception is imperfect, I'm going to show you a video and you just need to follow along with what the video says. This is an awareness test. 
How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? No! So most people tend to miss the moonwalking bear in that video because of the imperfection of our perception. Um, we see what we want to see. And so since we were counting the number of passes, we didn't see the whole picture. We didn't pay attention to um, the moonwalking bear that wasn't relevant to the number of passes that were occurring. And so the developmental systems theory is really arguing that we're very complex creatures in a multi-layered context with a lot going on in our environment and it's affecting us, it's affecting our perception and our perception is then affecting our development. So no single factor, according to Lerner, can really be seen as the primary or ultimate cause on our development, but rather our development is the product of the complicated interaction between nature and nurture. So that's it for chapter two. You are going to want to go back to Moodle and complete the third lecture activity and then come back another day and um, complete the homework assignments, the self-check and the forum. Thank you. Have a great day.